Rachel, and this is Recovery Daily Podcast. Today's topic is doing the work in recovery. So often in my life, I have had a mindset of being a victim, um, being the victim of my environment um, versus having an action-based mindset. And this is what I want to talk about today. So um, when I was younger and really all through until I got sober, (laughs) that uh, nothing was ever good enough, nothing was ever big enough, nothing, you know, I could never, it even went all the way to drinking, like I could never get enough, you know, I could never get enough alcohol. So, um anything that happened in my life happened to me. That was my mindset. So imagine, you know, I, I grew up with divorced parents. Um, I became a divorcee. I then I was an alcoholic. Then I had a stroke. Um, When I was raising my kids, I was broke, you know, all of this it's so easy to have a victim mindset um, that, you know, why is it that out of all three siblings, I'm the one who was the alcoholic? You know, why am I, why did it happen to me out of um, all the people who got a COVID vaccine why? I mean, can you imagine <laughs> I what that feels like to be like, you know, like I heard that there were side effects, but you never think it's going to happen to you until it happens to you. And I'm like, I had a freaking stroke at 46 years old. I never imagined in my wildest nightmares that I was going to be a 46-year-old who has a stroke. You know, I only ever saw nothing, nothing like that happens to me. You know what I mean? But more and more, this stuff is happening to me, you know? And, And I, if I don't change my mindset, it's like I... I ha- I have the worst luck, you know. Um and so I've had to really learn how to change my mindset to life is going to deal all of us our set of cards. And my cards are my own hand. You know, I was talking to my dad the other day. This is my reality. And, and um, we create our own reality based on what's around us, based on our beliefs. And, and so what I never really realized back when I was having this victim mindset is that everything is a choice. And the more that I can be present and think about these, some of these things that I've talked about in past episodes, like um, the if then grateful list, like to be mindful enough and aware enough to know that if this didn't happen to me, then this opportunity wouldn't have um, showed up. So um, like I've talked about in the past episode, if I was not an alcoholic, I would not have the tools that I do today to face stroke recovery. I just would not. I, I, I can't imagine what kind of nightmare that would be like for me to not have this tool set that I've been given through my recovery um, and sobriety. 
And so shifting my perspective, I feel like all week I've been talking about shifting perspective, shifting my perspective from what happens to me to what choices can I make and what actions can I take to create the environment that I want, to create the reality that I want. Um, I can, you know, this, this deck of car or the cards that I've been dealt, um, I can pick them up and, and move them around and I can make sense of them. Um, I don't have to just stare down and look at the cards that I've been dealt and well, that's it. Sucks for you, Rach. You're a divorced alcoholic who had a stroke at the age of 46. And um, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Um, I don't have to do that. Um, as a part of my sobriety recovery, I had to recognize that, that I was powerless over alcohol. I also had to recognize that I was powerless over people, places, and things. I can't control them. I can't control what you're going to do. Um, in a, you know, I want to. I want everyone to do my everything my way. <laughs> That's why I think that I'm a good... <laughs> I'm a good um, person of leadership in my job because I have a little more um, control over guiding people to do it, do things a certain way. But my staff knows, if you're listening, they know that quite often I provide my recommendation and I listen to theirs, and we usually go with theirs. Usually my entire team disagrees with me, and we go with what they want. So I, I don't mean at all to, to compare control uh, to being a person in leadership, but it is, uh, it is a good position to me in that I feel like I have a voice. You know, I feel like I feel like um, I feel more empowered to share my voice, share my opinion, and that sort of thing. But I still cannot control anyone or anything. Um, I have to live life on life's terms, no matter what. So being um, a, an alcoholic in recovery, I learn, and I talked about this the other day, I learned that um, life is still going to happen to me. And life very much has just happened to me. The good, the bad. Um, and, and I had bad things and good things just happen to me today. And I just have to suit up and show up and make choices that, that help me navigate each one. So, for example, today we took our dog, Boris. He's a 65-pound bulldog. And I would say um, maybe 20 pounds of that is lips. And... 40 pounds of that is just plain old torso <laughs> and the rest is his tiny little head. Anyway, we took him to the groomer today to get his nails trimmed and um, and so I wanted to go along for the ride. One, because I keep trying to practice um, doing these things. And I also wanted to bring my dog, Autumn, who's a 65-pound Weimaraner, quite different from the bulldog. 
because I wanted her to be a comfort to the bulldog because uh, Boris gets very nervous, ridiculously nervous when he walks into PetSmart, no matter what we're doing in PetSmart. So um, anyway, I wanted I wanted his big sister to be a comfort. So we went to PetSmart and the uh, the grooming um, appointment was going to take longer than we had suspected. So it was going to the lady said an hour and a half. I'm like, he does not have an hour and a half uh, worth of body. But OK, <laughs> whatever. He's just a round ball. How does it take an hour and a half? Anyway. Um, so we, I wanted to take a walk and, you know, I've been talking about that a lot, wanting to take a walk. So we, my boyfriend and I walked down the street with my, uh, with Autumn and we walked really slow and you know what? I could do it. I didn't feel sick and it made me realize that when I'm trying to go walking, I'm trying to go walking my crazy fast paced walking, which is if you ask my daughter, she tells me that she can't keep up with me. <laughs> and she is a um, D3 soccer player, was a D3 soccer player. Um, so she's very in shape, but uh, I, I outwalk her apparently. So I think maybe part of the problem is that I walk too fast. So I figured out today that um, just because I I decided to suit up and show up, I figured out a possible solution for my walking conundrum. So um, then we got back and I felt... I felt like I needed to take a nap because that's what I do after I have any activity in the world. I have to take a nap. Um, so I went upstairs and an hour later, guess who walked into my bedroom? My daughter. She came to visit me. So um, so that was wonderful. And so I had two hours visiting with her. And that was just I didn't want to let go of her. Um and then when she left, I thought, oh, my gosh, I didn't get my nap today. I feel absolutely terrible. So um, I just went and laid down again. And um, and so I'm giving a bad example of making choices to try to create an environment that I want. So... I made choices today in order to try to progress in my recovery and that um, I did go to a PetSmart and we did go outside and walk and I figured out a possible solution and then I came home and I was rewarded by my daughter coming home and stuff like that and then but in the end, I still, I am ending my day feeling really, really poor. And that's because I didn't get my nap today. So it's not like every day is going to go perfect for me. But um, I continue to try to channel my energy towards my recovery, towards the, the pursuit of of joy. And I experienced it a couple times today. Even though I feel shitty, um, I got to feel some joy today. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't, um, if I didn't just suit up and show up and, and do the work to try to try to move me in the direction that I want to move in for the recovery. And what I have also found in uh, sobriety recovery is that it takes a lot of discipline and commitment. And so one thing that I know that I can acknowledge that I have not been doing so great until um, the past month is finding that discipline 
in um, not using digital devices, not uh, watching TV, not taking walks, not doing any of these things that bother my eyes. But I'm doing it now because now I'm seeing the correlation between the, the discipline I had to have when I got sober and the discipline I have to have now to actually, there's no dipping and dabbling. I can't just go have a beer here and there. I need to completely restrain, refrain from drinking. And so I need to do the same thing uh, in my stroke recovery. I need to completely refrain from things that, um, that bother my head. And I need to be committed to that. Um, it's not just on, um, on the weekdays that I do this. It has to be on the weekends also. And, um, and that's where I've got to do a lot of, a lot of mental health care in order to keep myself well disciplined and committed. And, um, whenever I think of discipline and commitment, I think of Queen Elizabeth. And the reason why is, I watched the the crown um, and I love the crown and my obsession with Queen Elizabeth started um, years ago, over 20 years ago when I went to London with my mom for work and um, I had to train um, a, uh, a group of airline fare coders. And so I had to um, train them how to code the, the prices and the restrictions around airline fares into the system. And um, on my, I got the flu on the way there. And so I had to train the whole time I, I was there. And that's totally beside the point. But I, it's, it, it's uh, one of the top things that I think of when I think of that trip. But uh, my mom and I got to take a day and go um, see the castles and stuff like that. And, and it was so cool. And so ever since then, I've been kind of obsessed with the whole British family and stuff like that. Um, anyway, when The Crown came out, I was really excited to be able to have something else to learn more about the royal family. And, and so as far as discipline uh, goes, part of the crown, if you've seen it, they show uh, her like brushing her hair in front of the mirror before she goes to bed. They show her washing her face before she goes to bed. And they show her get on her knees beside her bed um, and pray before she goes to bed and then she crawls into bed. And so this is something that I picked up um, kind of soon after I finished watching that season of The Crown. And that's because I had heard in my recovery lots of people saying they uh, you know, I get down on my knees and I was like, I'm not getting down on my knees. Somebody might see me. <laughs> um, but what I ended up doing is realizing I've talked about acting as if, well, I did the same thing. I decided I was going to do the same thing that uh, I take su all suggestions. I don't pick and choose what my suggestions are. So if they suggest to me, that I need to get down on my knees, I got down on my knees beside my bed before I go to bed. And all I do is um, I always think about when I was the little girl and I was telling my cat about my day when I got home from school. For some reason, that moment in time is locked in my head. And so when I get on my knees at the end of the night, at the end of the day, to um, be grateful for my sobriety and for not smoking, um, I think of that little girl uh, all the time, me, the little girl. And um, anyway, uh, I've created that discipline as well. So I've become more and more a person of discipline. 
And there's a lot of things that I talk about in the podcast that I repeat over and over again. And I hope that that comes across as a sign of how disciplined I am and how I actually live the things that I'm talking about. I'm not just pulling all of these out of the air. I've had lots of people asking me, um, how do you come up with so many things to talk about? How do you come up with something to talk about every day? And it's because it's exactly the name of the podcast. Recovery is a daily thing. It's a daily thing. And so every day... I am fighting for myself, not only um, as, a, as a recovering alcoholic, but as a, uh, a stroke survivor. Every day, I am having self-talk and telling myself, you can do this. You can get through this. You can be happy. You can find joy. And so I am putting in the work every day. That's why I have something to talk about every day because I don't, um, it's not, um, I don't know. It's not an every other day kind of thing. It's not a once a week kind of thing. Um, so I put in the work. And so I was thinking, what are the, what's the work? What's the work that I put in? What does work look like in my recovery? in both uh, sobriety and uh, as a stroke survivor. So work, as funny as it is, can look like rest. I'm putting in the work um, to feed and nurture my body. And by doing that, I am resting. So work can look like rest. Work can look like patience because... If I'm getting all stressed out about uh, this or that at work, that is not taking care of my body either. So putting in the work is really um, finding those tools that you can use in order to um, start to own some patience with other people and with yourself. And along with that, acceptance, work can look like acceptance because I, you know, I have people saying things all the time that I don't agree with. And I very rarely, very rarely will speak up and say, I, what, what you are saying is ridiculous. And I totally agree. You're an idiot. (laughs) I don't say that. And that's because that's their opinion. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I could give a shit what you think. I really could. Because at the end of the day, all I want to do is care about you as a human being. I, I don't care. I don't care what you believe in, um, religiously, politically, um, uh, medically. I, I could give a shit. I really could. Because at the end of the day, I love you for who you are as an entire package. And if you didn't believe that thing that I disagree with, then you wouldn't be the person that I love. The person that I love has to disagree with me um, because that's that's what 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 makes you you. So acceptance can look like work. Reaching out to others like me, um, finally reaching out and finding this. Well, thanks to my sister, finding this stroke support group. That is work. That's it's getting uncomfortable journaling. I do a lot of journaling. And sometimes, uh, like today, I was taking the dogs out to uh, play in the baby pool. Yes, it's adorable. And so I ran back in to go get my my Remarkable because 
I uh, felt like that was a good time for me to continue to jot down some of my thoughts about what I wanted to talk about today, because there are things, like I said, I'm doing this every day. So um, there are things that cross my mind throughout the day that I want to make sure I write down. And um, it's good. I'm not doing it for the podcast. I'm doing it for myself. This is all selfish. It It's all selfish, but I know that by putting my thoughts together and being able to put them in a way that articulates a story that I can help another person. So it's selfish and, and not selfish. When I first got sober, for me, work looked like 20 minutes of reading literature every day. Every day I put aside 20 minutes of reading something that had to do with alcoholism. Work can look like going bowling with other people like me, like people in my fellowship. I've done that before. Work can look like volunteering because the more that I put myself around people like me, the more that I'm going to have conversations with them, the more I'm going to learn about how they are living their lives in recovery. Work can look like therapy, whether it's um, addiction therapy, uh, vision therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. Um, it's, It's work. That is definitely work. And work can be listening. When I go to my 7 a.m. sobriety meeting every morning, um, I put in the work, which is me dialing a phone number on Zoom, and then I listen. I just listen to what other people have to say. And that's putting in work. So uh, the other part of, of, uh, of doing the work is doing the next right thing. So this is something I learned in my sobriety recovery, but I'm carrying it over into stroke recovery. And, um, and that is that when I first got sober, I would go to a 10 a.m. meeting on Saturday mornings. And after working five hours, uh, sorry, not five hours, five days a week, and then driving three hours a day, then the last thing I wanted to do on a Saturday morning was to drive myself to a sobriety meeting. I did not want to do that. Um, But I learned in my program to do the next right thing. And they didn't tell me this part in uh in my program, they didn't say, do the next right thing, even though you're not going to feel like it. That's just understood. They didn't say, do the next right thing, which out without even thinking about what you want to do. These are like, this is self talk that I have had to add to the script for myself in order to really do it. So uh, for me, I would stand up at 9.30 on Saturday morning. I was thinking in my head, I do not want to drive to this meeting, but I just stood up. I made my feet move, even though my brain didn't want to move. Even though my brain didn't want my body to move, I stood up anyway. And once you take that first move, then I took a step. And then I took another step. And so because that was sometimes the next right thing is the next right thing that very second or the next right thing that very minute. And that's what the next right thing was for me. So I knew the next right thing was to go to the meeting, but I couldn't think that far ahead. Um, Just like sometimes in sobriety, it's it's minute by minute. We're supposed to live in today, but sometimes I had to live in the minute because every second I had to, um, 
I had to fight that obsession to drink um, early on in sobriety. So the next right thing to me was minute by minute, second by second. Um, When I first got sober, I also, this is disgusting, but I'm going to share anyway. My, I was so bad off that I was not the most hygienic. I was not taking showers as much as I should have. I was not brushing my teeth as much as I should have. Um, because all I wanted to do was drink. Um, I know anybody who's listening to this who does not suffer from the disease of alcoholism would not understand that. I know that they would not understand that. Um, There may be people who suffer from the disease of alcoholism who don't understand that. But for me, that's what my disease looked like. It made me not even want to get out of bed. So when I first got sober, doing the work was just getting in the shower, was just picking up my toothbrush, you know, that sometimes doing the work is just moving towards what you know you should be doing, picking up the phone to call another person in recovery, saying thank you to somebody who pissed you off, saying thank you through gritted teeth, putting on your running shoes without thinking about whether you really want to run or not. You just know that you need to exercise. You know that you've got energy that needs to come out of you. So for me, I back when I was running every day, I didn't always think about the fact that I needed to go out and run. I just picked up my shoes and put my shoes on. Sometimes in the morning, I'm so tired that I put my feet on the floor before I lift my head off of the pillow. It's it's uncomfortable sometimes, (laughs) but you get what I'm saying. Um. You know, going to, I remember when I was going to a, my addiction therapist for a couple of years, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go because after a while, you kind of feel like, I don't know that I have anything else I need to talk about. But I picked up my keys anyway and just started walking towards the car, whether I wanted to do it or not. And of course, I would leave my therapist's office kind of having a half grin on my face like uh, because I got what I needed. Even though I didn't want to do it, even though I didn't think I needed anything, I did the next right thing and it turns out that I did need it. So I've talked about turning off my wanter and and doing the next right thing before the doubt even seeps in. And so I was thinking, things only happen to me when I'm standing still. It's like back when I used to play softball, it's like having a ball coming at me and just letting it hit me in the face. Um... I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't just sit there and let the ball hit me in the face. But you know what? When I was drinking, I was just standing there and letting the ball hit me in the face over and over and over again. And the past two years that I've been struggling with my stroke symptoms and not telling anybody and not doing anything about it, I was just standing there letting the ball hit me in the face over and over again. It's insane. So I've decided to pick up a glove and catch the ball. And I can really relate to, side note, I can really relate to ball hitting you in the face 
when I was in softball in high school, I was out in right field and I had my glove up in the air and the sun was shining perfectly through the, uh, through the glove and, um, the ball. And so the sun just shined in my face and the ball hit me in the forehead. That was, that happened once. And then another time I was playing second base And a grounder was coming at me. And it's your worst nightmare when you're catching a grounder. It hit a rock right at the wrong time. And the softball hit me square in the throat. It was terrible. But, you know, but I still showed up to softball practice the next day. Um, And I kept coming back because, um, because I wanted to keep getting better at it. So I kept suiting up and showing up. So if I don't take action like I'm doing now with my stroke, and if I don't seek care for my stroke symptoms, nothing's going to change. If I don't do anything, then I am just a poor 48-year-old lady who had a stroke. But instead, I'm searching for the next right thing so that I can get better or at least understand what my long-term limitations are going to be because maybe, maybe I can't work. I I don't know. I still don't know what's going to happen. I'm hoping I can. I'm hoping that, um, if people who have massive strokes have a full recovery, I'm hoping that I can, because I didn't have a massive stroke. I don't know what's the difference between massive, but seeing that I can walk and talk and and move all my body parts, I don't think I had anything close to a, a massive stroke. But um, I feel like if they can recover fully, why couldn't I? So by doing that, um, I'm also getting a lot of outreach from other people. And there's a lot of people that I just had an old neighbor of mine from Charlestown, West Virginia, reach out to me today and just tell me she was thinking about me. And it meant so much to me. So thank you to you who reached out to me. And thank you to everybody for listening. I've gotten so much um, love coming my way. So, um, thanks again. And, uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow.